When I first went up to Oxford in 1927, my college tutor said to me, Ah, oh, my dear fellow, so you're going to read history. Fascinating subject. After all, what is history? Divine gossip about the past among gentlemen. Have another glass of port. History is more than a page in a book. History is the buckle that bites your back. History is the sweat you can't keep out of your eyes. History is the fear crawling in your belly. Shamai everybody, my name's Nick Stradling and if you watch this channel you may know about the scrape I nearly got into with ITV Wales regarding this series a couple of years ago back in 2017. I'm not here today to talk about that battle nor am I here to wax lyrical about the profound effect this series had on me as an individual. Well, maybe just a little bit because it's fair to say that this series in a way kind of changed my life. Today, I'm going to go through it with you as quickly and succinctly as I can, hopefully without annoying ITV Wales' copyright people. So, here is The Dragon Has Two Tongues in 10 Minutes. We're going to start off with episodes one and two together. They were called Where to Begin and When Was Wales? And they very much do what they say on the tin in that they ask questions. You've got Winford Thomas over in the West focusing on the Red Lady of Pavilland more than 20,000 years ago. And then we find Gwynolf Williams down a mine shaft well, in Blanavon, built in the Industrial Revolution. Now, what these two episodes do brilliantly is almost like the beginning of a good movie, is they establish our two main characters, who are, of course, Winford Vaughan Thomas and Gwyn Alf Williams. Very much an establishment royalist romantic, gentle British nationalist pitched against a firebrand, Marxist, Welsh nationalist. And this sets up the rest of the 11 episodes brilliantly. And these two characters are going to clash on more or less every topic connected to Welsh history over the next six and a half hours. Also, what these two episodes do very well is they showcase the kinesthetic, brilliant, energetic direction by Colin Thomas. Like, you know, these days, of course, the camera has to move all over the place on a dolly, on a slider, on a drone or whatever. Back in those days, a tripod or a crane was all you really had. But if you watch the series, you can see how Colin Thomas uses the environment to give the series that essential energy and vibrancy. These two episodes, they're like a good setup. They, they focus on prologue. They're looking at when and where this history and these histories of Wales should begin rather than focusing on any individual historical events themselves. That starts to happen in episode three, which is titled Aliens in Their Own Land, which refers to the Welsh battling the oncoming Saxons. Well, when was Wales? Well, I'd, I, I won't give you a birth day. My guess would be between 8600 and 8800. And in this one, they go through about four to five hundred years of very violent Welsh history in 25 minutes. What was notable and important about this episode for me were the Arthurian references. Arthur of Britain, the hero of a defeated and dispossessed people. Now, of course, Wales did the origin of the Arthurian legend, but this was the first time I'd ever heard that. This episode was also the first time that I heard names such as Ivor Bach, Rodri Maur, and Howell Var. So I believe it's a really important episode in giving kids and adults like me a springboard into Welsh history. This episode is also notable because it gives an insight into the essential worldviews and contradictions and paradoxes of its two main presenters. And you start to be able to spot that the format each episode is going to take, which is that the two presenters argue about their different narratives and their different ideas of world history and then meet at the end of the episode to debate all the issues. And that's what's going to happen in every episode from now until episode 13. The Welsh. They call themselves Cymru, and their little kingdoms built themselves up into four major kingdoms, the strongest of them Gwynedd. Out of it came Rodri Mawr, first high king of all Wales. But in a sense, these kingdoms were a myth at every crisis they'd fall apart again and then reconstruct themselves again. There was permanent tension, permanent conflict. Moreover, these people operated to the clan system. Perpetual conflict? Yes, I suppose Professor Gwyn Williams was right to revel in this gloomy chronicle. 
And maybe all that murder and mayhem was the price the ruling classes had to pay for their privileges. And it was when the last traditional king of Wales, of king of the Hybard, Risa Tudor, was killed by Normans in 1093, that both the Welsh Chronicles and the Norman Chronicles said, with the killing of Rhys, kings cease to bear rule in Wales. And my personal reaction to that would be, thank God for that. Oh, where you go again. Now look, it was the only possible form of social organisation. We're talking about a period a thousand years ago, and across that vast gulf of age, you can't just keep on shaking your fist at these poor rulers. Well, if you want to shake your fist, episode four and five, titled The Norman Smash and Grab and Under the Heel, looks at the Norman invasion and 1066, right up until the murder and death of the last native prince and ruler of Wales, Llewellyn ap Griffith, otherwise known as Llewellyn the Last, in 1282. And Under the Heel goes from this fall right up until the rise of the Welsh rebel Owain Glyndwr. In terms of the history and what lessons we can take from this, episode four, I think, is vital in looking at how we as Welsh people and as Welsh nationalists perceive and study our own royal past. UK media terminology, it would be Gwyn who would be labelled the nationalist, yet Winford would be termed a UK patriot or loyalist. But when you look at their two perspectives on this particular event, you can really see that it's Winford who has all the traits of classic nationalism. Also, episode five gives Gwynalf Williams a chance to totally shine while speculating on the psychological legacy on the Welsh people of the bloody Glyndwr Rebellion. These two cover what could be the definitive era that has shaped the Wales we know today, although many of us won't know it. Episode 6 looks at the Tudors and the assimilation of Wales into the Kingdom of England, and Episode 7 discusses the new Welsh gentry as the better off in Wales fully embrace their new English customs and opportunities. Notable moments covered include the Acts of Union, the banning of the Welsh language from public life, Bishop Morgan's translation of the Bible into Welsh, Dr John Dee, Prince Maddock and the myth of the Welsh-speaking Indigenous Americans. There's so much vital Welsh history crammed into these two episodes, so much information which contextualises Wales as a distinct national entity that, viewing it for the first time aged 24, produced in me what can only be reasonably described as a shift in consciousness. I'm going to go to the next 
I'm including the following debate in this clip because the exchanges therein have become so familiar to me in the 20 years since, and I'm probably risking my impartiality by commenting any further. But check this out. And it's a debate and an exchange which is repeated at the end of episode 8 called Rebirth of a Nation. This is the one which I feel lets itself down just a wee bit. It focuses mainly on the rise of the Welsh Methodist Church, but more or less glosses over the contributions of a certain Yolo Morganu. Now, Gwynolf is as seductive and as energetic and manic as ever, but given that Winford Thomas's view of Welsh history was summed up with words such as continuity and memory, I would have loved to have heard his take on the propaganda and the forgeries made by Yolo Morganig and his colleagues, which is a wee bit of a shame, but we're definitely back on form with the next episode, number nine, The Crucible. Dick Pendering and the Merthyr Rising of 1831. Yes, our two presenters are fabulous and their insights and perspectives essential. But without Colin Thomas's direction, without his ingenuity and his inventiveness, this series just doesn't work on the level that it does. Check him out. Kevin, on their way to Merthyr, kilt swinging to receive a ribald welcome from the inhabitants. Go home and put your trousers on, the women yelled at them. Reinforcements were ordered, and along this route between Brecon and Merthyr, there came the vital ammunition supply train. But they didn't get through. Armed workers up here stopped them. A hundred yeomanry cavalry came galloping out of Merthyr. The workers rolled rocks on them, fired on them, beat them off. Now we're moving into the end of the series with the last four episodes which kind of go over the rise and perhaps the fall of socialism for the Welsh people. They're called From Riot to Respectability, How Red Was My Valley, Exodus and The Death of Wales. We cover events such as the Rebecca Riots, Struggle for Democracy, Chartist Rising, Blue Books, Nonconformism, Liberalism, the Radical Welsh Press. The crossover, the end, the 19th, and the beginning of the 20th centuries. The defining importance of coal in the history of Wales. David Lloyd George, Haith Wynne, Winston Churchill, the Tonopandi riots. The depression after World War I. Women's rebellion, means testing, dole cuts, the separation of church and state, the exodus of Welsh communities, the immigration of the English into the North and South formerly working class communities. These final episodes have a kind of a sadness to them, as well as a reflexive quality, which gives an insight into Colin Thomas's filmmaking process. There's many things I could say about episode 13, The Death of Wales, but I'll just say for now that discovering about the drowning of Capel Kellen not only shocked me, but elicited in me all sorts of different questions. Did they need their own democracy with teeth? And there's two points I want to raise to emphasize that. Number one, I didn't sit there, watch this series 15 years ago, and immediately spring up to join Plaid Cymru and the cause of Welsh independence. The process was far more subtle, far more gradual than that. Secondly, the biggest quality of The Dragon Has Two Tongues is the bipartisan nature of the debates. It's in this duality that the series retains its uniqueness, its power, and its potential. So, why can we not see it? The series is, of course, far from perfect. Were it to be remade today, it would have to reflect a far more diverse audience. But standing here in front of this institution that was secured at the back end of the 20th century, I can't help but feel that whatever your age, your colour, your sexuality, your gender, 
whatever your first language, that the more of our youngsters who get a chance to view and experience this series, the bigger chance this institution and this country itself has of surviving into the 21st century and beyond. I call on the Welsh Government, the Welsh media and everyone involved in our public life to work with ITV Wales and the National Library to secure the legacy of this series and let's get it into our homes and hopefully into our schools sooner rather than later. Diolch yn am gwylio. See you later. But my vote view after that rereading will come still the conviction that if we look back into our history we will get the courage to continue because Whatever Welsh history teaches, I, I'm now risking thinking that history teaches you something. To me, Welsh history teaches the art of survival. Yes, if we make that history a weapon, we will live if we act.